Thanks to Linode, a top-rated cloud computing company, for supporting this episode of SciShow. Head to linode.com slash scishow to learn more and get $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. Nature is full of substances and materials with a potential to treat illness and injury. And humans are not the only ones who have figured that out. Many animals exhibit behaviors that are thought to involve using a natural product to cause some desired effect. It can be tough to determine exactly why an animal is doing something, though. So we look for them eating or outwardly applying some material to increase their chance of survival, but only when they have a specific problem. For example, lizards eat roots that appear to counteract snake venom, and fruit flies may lay their eggs in certain plants to protect their babies from wasps. Still, our inferences are always circumstantial. But things got more interesting this week when a German research team announced that they had observed a new form of self-medication in wild chimpanzees in Gabon. That alone isn't surprising. It's how the chimps do it that's new. Researchers observed chimps catching insects and putting them on open wounds. Over a 15-month period, the scientists documented 22 instances of the chimps putting insects on a wound, and most of them played out exactly the same way. The ape would catch a flying insect, immobilize it by squeezing it between their lips, place it on a wound, and move it around, then fish it out of the wound. The researchers think that this might have some anti-inflammatory or antiseptic benefit. In three of the observations, though, the researchers saw something special. The chimpanzees were applying insects to another chimp's wounds, and not just their kids or siblings, but to totally unrelated members of the the group. In one case, three other chimpanzees helped out. It's worth noting that the researchers don't yet know what beneficial properties these insects might have, or even what kinds of insects were used. I guess it's hard to get close enough to see exactly what kind of bug an ape is catching without, like, bothering the ape. It's possible that this is more of a cultural practice specific to this group of chimps than something with a specific biological benefit, though that would still be super interesting for the researchers studying their social dynamics. If no other chimp groups display this behavior, that would be a clue. Medicating other individuals seems to be an example of a pro-social behavior, or action that benefits another individual. Humans engage in pro-social behavior out of empathy and concern for others, but there's a lot of debate over whether other species are pro social for the same reason. In this case, helping an unrelated individual with wound care doesn't seem like it provides much benefit to the helper, so it might be a great tool to help scientists learn more about what drives members of non-human species to help each other out. The researchers plan to study the social aspects of insect wound treatment, looking at who gives and receives treatment, how new chimps learn to use insects on wounds in the first place, and whether the bugs have any pharmaceutical benefit. That could tell us a lot about pro-social behavior in chimpanzees disease, and even about the evolution and drivers of pro-social behavior in general. But now! We turn to a community of animals with substantially fewer brains. A paper published this week in Nature Communications looked into how communities of sea sponges in the central Arctic Ocean survive. Sponges often live in really dense groups called sponge grounds. And because sponges are filter feeders, these sponge grounds tend to crop up in areas with a lot of carbon in the water, because more carbon means more of the organic material that the sponges eat. The sponge ground on the Langsith Ridge in the central Arctic Ocean is about 330 kilometers south of the the North Pole. It is the densest and most northerly sponge ground ever discovered. And researchers were scratching their heads about how it could be there at all. It's usually covered in sea ice, and algae and the sea ice don't produce much carbon, not enough to support a huge sponge community. The sponges here live on underwater mountains formed by volcanoes, which sometimes release things like methane, but these mountains are totally inactive. So scientists had no idea what they were actually eating. So they measured the amount of carbon and nitrogen in the sponges and compared them to possible food sources. They combined that information with seafloor mapping to get a better sense of how the area could provide for so many sponges. And they found that under the sponges, the mountain peaks were covered in tubes left behind by tube worms, which would track because those worms tend to live in places where gases like methane seep out. But again, the mountains aren't active, and the worms are not alive anymore, that is. The carbon and nitrogen samples of sponge tissue actually matched samples of the tubes, which suggests that that is where they are getting those elements, from dead tube worms. The sponges are sustaining themselves on a completely extinct ecosystem. An ecosystem of methane seeps and tube worms that had been extinct 
for thousands of years. Sponges are hugely important to underwater ecosystems because they provide places for other species to live. They also filter water, which affects availability of nutrients and other particles cycling in the water. And the scientists think that's what's happening in the Langsith Ridge. Microscopic sponge parts mix with the empty worm tubes to form a dense mat across the mountaintop. And that mat and the sponges themselves provide a home to a bunch of microbes. The microbes chow down on the old tubes and break the nutrients in them down into tiny pieces that dissolve in the water. Then the sponges filter the water and get all that good stuff. As bizarre as this ecosystem is, it's important to understand how it works. The sea ice in this area is rapidly melting, and that change is going to be a big shock to all the critters that have made a home there for thousands of years. And conservationists can't protect ecosystems if they don't understand how they work. So hopefully, learning how sponges survive and thrive on an extinct ecosystem might actually keep the new ecosystem from going extinct, too. You are probably using cloud computing technology to watch SciShow. And this video is sponsored by Linode, a cloud computing company that strives to make this stuff simple, affordable, and accessible to everyone. Cloud computing stores data, hosts websites, and accesses software online, so you don't have to worry about finding the right equipment or servers for your home or office. With Linode, you can scale faster and cut costs compared to other cloud providers. Linode has a full marketplace of open source cloud applications that you can start using today. Best of all, if you run into any issues getting started, their support professionals are available to help by phone or ticket 24-7, 365 days of the year. You can see all that Linode has to offer by clicking the link in the description or heading to linode.com slash scishow. That link will also give you a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching.